प्रसार भारती अभिलेखा गार की प्रस्तुति सदा बहार सुनहरे दौर का अनमोल खजाना टुडे इंडिया इज सेलिब्रेटिंग विद द रेस्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड द फर्स्ट बर्थ सेंटिनरी ऑफ स्वामी विवेकानंद ही केम इन द अनब्रोकन लाइन ऑफ स्पिरिचुअल टीचर्स हु ब्राइटन द स्काई ऑफ इंडिया फ्रॉम द वैदिक पीरियड टू द मॉडर्न एज इट इज दे हु इंपार्टेड द स्पिरिचुअल एनर्जी एंड डायरेक्शन कैरेक्टरिस्टिक ऑफ इंडियन कल्चर it is because they came age after age that india is still alive in spite of invasions subjections and devastations a fraction of which has destroyed many a nation and many a culture in world history the periodical touch of these masterminds gave india renewed strength and hope every time by the end of the 18th century india had become old and defeated broken and dispirited and awaited either dissolution and death or reintegration and life her innate spiritual strength burst forth at the prospect of this danger and a new life came to her by the beginning of the 19th century she accepted the challenge of the age and resolved to meet the challenge in a creative constructive manner this rejuvenation process was spearheaded by a mighty and far sighted personality raja ram mohan roy who strove to awaken his countrymen purify and strengthen the age old culture of his people and to effect a synthesis of ancient indian heritage and modern western heritage this process of reawakening continued throughout the century throwing up great leaders and movements and toward the end of the century it found its full maturity and consummation through the lives and teachings of its most dynamic and authentic representatives sri ramakrishna and swami vivekananda though born in india they represented the spiritual hopes and aspirations of all mankind they were universe souls in the language of rome roland vivekananda took india out of her isolation of centuries and brought her into the stream of international life and thought he awakened the people of india to the realities and demands of the modern age swami vivekananda span of earthly life was hardly 40 years but within this short period he lived an intense life first as a student in school and college then as the foremost disciple of his great master sri ramakrishna then as a wanderer across the length and breadth of india and lastly as the spiritual teacher of west and east he was a spiritual teacher of a rare type himself immersed in god in the bliss of god he came down to the ordinary levels of life to uplift and brighten the lives of men and women his public teaching commenced with his speech at the chicago parliament of religions in 1893 and he passed away on july 4th 1902 he spent four intense years in the united states and england and five equally intense years in india delivering his message of a universal and practical spirituality and setting in motion a movement as an effective conduit for the furtherance of his message everywhere he taught man to realize his divine nature the innate divinity of man was the constant theme of all his teachings this teaching cuts across all divisions based on political or religious affiliations its assimilation by man will make for a character at once deep and broad he held that spirituality was the core of every religion dogmatic exclusiveness and intolerance are no part of true religion the more spiritual a man the more universal he is he held that the modern age stood in urgent need of this education from religion by which men will learn to make their love of god flow into the love and service of all men he worked hard to give the spiritual orientation to the world's religions so that they may be transformed into holy constructive forces and become capable to redeem modern man from his inner impoverishment in the context of external enrichment while speaking on vivekananda it is best to let vivekananda speak for himself there is a beauty and a power in his words which fascinate the listener referring to this roman rola says in his life of vivekananda vivekananda's words are great music phrases in the style of beethoven stirring rhythms like the march of handel choruses i cannot touch these sayings of his scattered as they are 
through the pages of books at 30 years distance without receiving a thrill through my body like an electric shock. And what shocks, what transports must have been produced when in burning words they issued from the lips of the hero. In a letter to an American lady written on 21st March 1895, Swami Vivekananda says, my master used to say that these names as Hindu, Christian, etc. stand as great barriers to all brotherly feelings between man and man. We must try to break them down first. They have lost all their good powers and now only stand as baneful influences under whose black magic even the best of us behave like demons. We will have to work hard and must succeed. The closing words of his address on Hinduism delivered to the Chicago Parliament of Religions breathe the spirit of the universal and human characteristic not only of him and of his great master but also of the Indian spiritual tradition and express his appreciation of the universality of the American mind which conceived and realized such an international assembly of world religions. Addressing the American nation with deep feeling, Vivekananda said, if there is ever to be a universal religion, it must be one which will have no location in place or time, which will be infinite, like the God it will preach, and whose sun will shine upon the followers of Krishna and of Christ, on saints and sinners alike, which will not be Brahminic or Buddhistic, Christian or Mohammedan, but the sum total of all these, and still have infinite space for development, which in its Catholicity will embrace in its infinite arms and find a place for every human being, from the lowest groveling savage, not far removed from the brute, to the highest man towering by the virtues of his head and heart, almost above humanity, making society stand in awe of him and doubt his human nature. It will be a religion which will have no place for persecution or intolerance in its polity, which will recognize divinity in every man and woman, and whose whole scope, whose whole force, will be centered in aiding humanity to realize its own true divine nature. Offer such a religion, and all the nations will follow you. Ashoka's council was a council of the Buddhist faith. Akbar's, though more to the purpose, was only a parlor meeting. It was reserved for America to proclaim to all, to all quarters of the globe that the Lord is in every religion. Swami Vivekananda defined his life's objective as twofold. Firstly, to place before man in East and West a comprehensive message of man's spiritual development and realization in clear, simple language. And secondly, to set in motion the wheel of such a spiritual message, to set in motion the wheel of Dharma, Dharma Chakra Pravartana in the expressive words of Buddha. Writing to an Indian disciple from America on 17th February 1896, Vivekananda expounded his first objective thus, to put the Hindu ideas into English and then make out of dry philosophy and intricate mythology and cure startling psychology a religion which shall be easy, simple, popular and at the same time meet the requirements of the highest minds is a task only those can understand who have attempted it. The abstract Advaita must become living, poetic in everyday life. Out of hopelessly intricate mythology must come concrete moral forms and out of bewildering yogism must come the most scientific and practical psychology and all this must be put in a form so that a child may grasp it. That is my life's work. Readers of Vivekananda's works know how great was his success in this field. Apart from his other books, his books on the four yogas, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga and Raja Yoga have become classics on spiritual life and realization. The reader is impressed by their simplicity of language and profundity of thought. Above all, they carry the impact of the man behind the message, the powerful impact of realized truth. On his second objective, he writes thus in a letter from America to an Indian disciple on 24th January 1894. My whole ambition in life is to set in motion a machinery which will bring noble ideas to the door of everybody and then let men and women settle their own fate. Let them know what our forefathers as well as other nations have thought 
on the most momentous questions of life. Let them see specially what others are doing now and then decide. We are to put the chemicals together. The crystallization will be done by nature according to her laws. Swami Vivekananda's lectures, letters and discourses run into eight published volumes in English. They are also being made available during this centenary year in ten volume editions in several of the Indian languages and selections of them in several foreign languages as well. This vast literature can be aptly described as literature immortal. It is a strengthening, purifying, broadening and illumining literature. It will educate the youth of today in the problems of the modern world and help him to solve them in the light of the eternal elements in the spiritual heritage of the East and the West. To the Indian youth in particular, this literature carries the message of a man making character building education and religion. The national ideals of India, says Vivekananda, are renunciation and service. Intensify her in those channels, the rest will take care of themselves. His literature will inspire our youths with these great national ideals of renunciation and service, intensifying which in their awareness and character, they will acquire the necessary strength of will and purpose to build a free and equalitarian society in their beloved motherland. It will educate them in the compelling message of international fellowship, cooperation and welfare and shape them into world citizens. This is the type of awakening that he personally imparted to thousands of spiritually sensitive souls in East and West alike during his brief earthly career. The same work of awakening he has continued to impart to an ever-increasing circle of men and women through his literature since his death. Teach yourselves, says he, teach everyone his real nature. Call upon the sleeping soul and see how it awakes. Power will come, glory will come, goodness will come, purity will come, and everything that is excellent will come when this sleeping soul is roused to self-conscious activity. In a letter from America to an Indian disciple on 31st August 1894, we find Vivekananda referring to this conviction of his, writes he, the whole world requires light. It is expectant. India alone has that light, not in magic, mummeries and charlatanism, but in the teaching of the glories of the spirit of real religion, of the highest spiritual truth. That is why the Lord has preserved the race through all its vicissitudes unto the present day. Now the time has come. The current celebrations of the birth centenary of Vivekananda will acquaint the nation with the life and work of one who represented in himself a condensed India and a synthesis of the best in the human heritage of East and West, of East and West.